All right, ladies and gents. Um, well, it's a pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Ronald Feuzel, who's in evidence. Um, this is a break with standard practice. Uh, we usually seek professional help with introduction uh, of speakers. Uh, and um, this time, uh, I decided not to do it because despite being completely unqualified uh, to judge others' achievements, uh, I can say that, as it were, I knew the artist as a young man. Uh, and so I'm somewhat qualified. So, so Albert and I met in um, 2003, which I suspect to much of this audience appears to be a much more ancient past even than it uh, appears to me to be now. Uh, so we both, uh, and this is an item from his, from his biography, uh, we both arrived that year to be JRFs at Wilson College uh, at the other place. Uh, now, uh, to me, the other place at that time still had a name, uh, and I uh, just arrived, but Aldo was a, was a weathered uh, denizen of, of the other place, although he was not a completely in-house product. So, uh, his, undergraduate, his undergraduate degree, he read uh, computer science and physics, and physics, <laughs> stress that, uh, in Germany, University of Bielefeld, I believe, um, where he wrote his uh, Diplom Arbeit, uh, which is an undergraduate thesis on nonlinear dynamical systems and neural networks. Having done that, he moved to, to a manual college. Uh, uh, at Cambridge uh, to study biology. And the combination of that uh, was an MPhil thesis on electrophysiological and behavioral study of complex motor behavior in freely moving insects. Did you parse that? <laughs> so uh, I don't, I don't, I don't think I totally know what this means. It does sound to me like studying how the flies buzz. <laughs> <laughs> And, and generally, buzz has been a distinctive feature of our theory uh, that follows both the buzz of the flies and the buzz of the of the uh, adoring public, as it were. Uh, so, um, uh, well, uh, so so then the next stage was the PhD, uh, which was also in Cambridge. Uh, so that at that time, I must have been feeling like once in Cambridge, forever in Cambridge. Leave. Uh, not true. Anyway, uh, he joined Simon Laughlin's group at the zoology department, zoology department now, uh, investigating the biophysical sources of neural variability. After graduating, he continued uh, as a, well, not quite continued, he became a postdoc uh, at the engineering department this time. See, if, 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 the, if, the, if you've ever met an interdisciplinary type, uh, that's today's speaker. So, um, anyway, he joined something called the Computational and Biological Learning Group uh, and worked with Daniel Wolpert on human sensor motor control. So that's, that's, I got this from his biography on his website, these, these things. Um, I didn't know these things then, that he was doing all that. Uh, so my own recollection, and we did, we did talk about that research, so my own recollection was that, uh, at least that's, that's the most vivid one, uh, was that they were torturing a fly uh, by, that it, this is true, I think, uh, uh, by making it watch TV, <laughs> so, clockwork orange style, right? and, and monitoring its brain activity. Now, we don't know, well, I don't know how much brain activity actually was detected, I suspect little, but, but, there, but there is something that I learned from, from those conversations. Right? So when I heard that, I knew then, as I know now, that we're dealing with a physicist at heart. Now, why is that? Uh, so, <laughs> well, let's ponder this. I, I think what this experiment shows is that he's identified, like physicists do, uh, a potential source for <coughs> studying universal, simple, fundamental behavior. Right? Because if you thought that there's anything we can learn about the human brain, which truly is the, is the mountain uh, goal, as I think we'll hear today, from a fly, 
Surely you can do this by making, by making a fly engage in such a simple and primitive activity as watching TV because, because the responses are likely to be similar. <laughs> right? So, uh, is that true? That, that point, right? <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> anyway, um, I don't know what else he did in Cambridge. Uh, after that, I think this, you know, we didn't really talk very much about, about science. I can tell you what he read. Uh, uh, but, but whatever it was, uh, uh, it was something good uh, on both fronts. Uh, because in 2008, there was a paper in Nature Reviews of Neuroscience that appeared called Noise in the Nervous System uh, by Aldo and, and co workers, um, which now has about 700 citations according to Google Scholar. So, uh, there you are, he became famous, and, and once that happened, uh, promptly in 2009, uh, Imperial College uh, poached him from uh, Cambridge to two departments, the departments of <coughs> Imperial College Departments of Bioengineering and of Computing, uh, which he joined as a senior lecturer in neurotechnology and set up the Brain and Behavior Lab, also known as the Faisal Lab. Um, now, since then, uh, I've been following his career, uh, mostly through the media. Uh, because there's been a lot of buzz, as I, as, as, as I promised you. So, so you know, if one, if one watched on the media, you could see, uh, you know, Aldo giving interviews to The Guardian, Aldo helping amputees and people with uh, 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 various neurological diseases, Aldo uh, giving a TED talk, Aldo meeting the Queen. <laughs> uh, true. Uh, at which point it was clear that he certainly made the cut for the Ocom lecture. <laughs> uh, so, and to complete the sort of run through his CV, uh, I can tell you that he's also an associate group head at the uh, MRC, uh, at the Ed Hersmet uh, Hospital. Uh, and besides all those things that he's done in research, he's also had stints in management consultancy at McKinsey and & Company and, uh, and as a quote for Credit Suisse uh, in, the, in investment banking. So he's, he's done the dark side as well. <laughs> now, this might start sounding to you like he's done it all. Uh, but I think we should say except for one thing. Right? And however, today, finally, with certainty, we can say that he has arrived at it pinnacle of recognition of the summit of human ambition. <laughs> he is finally here uh, to do and be the ultimate thing. So uh, I give you the 16th of the lecture. <laughs> Thank you, Alex, for this great introduction. Um, I hope my talk is going to be shorter than the introduction. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not going to comment on most of these facts. Um, what I'm going to do, though, is uh, preempting a uh, session introduction um, and prompting from an old friend for a, uh, the long version of my CV, I've restructured my talk a bit to, to reflect some of the things that Alex may be striking upon. So, how should you start such a lecture? I think you should start the lecture with Lord Kelvin. <laughs> In science, there's only physics, and all the rest is stamp collecting. So I'm going to talk a bit about physics and a bit about stamp collecting. Okay. And, 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 and what, so what we really want to do, so what I'm really interested in, is trying to do something like this. Try to reverse engineer the brain. And um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about you know, everything from the moment you perceive information, then you have to process information, you actually have to make a brain that can process information, to then decide about what this information, uh, what actions should be generated. And this happens continuously and continuously in a loop. So that's a good thing uh, because uh, you know, the, time, the arrow of time flies always forward. So one thing that's very important to us when we, when we think about the brain is that it's a closed loop system. You shouldn't cut open the loop. So a lot of classic neuroscience was, you know, you just study perception, you know, you give a stimulus, you measure the response, or you, uh, you trigger a movement and then you measure the movement. But we really want to think about this as a closed loop system that has to continually operate. So this is the way we think about that. And now I'm showing you my first stamp. And I'm going to ask the gentleman in the first row, who do you see? You see Einstein. Can I ask the youngsters in the cheap seats in the last row to, to tell me who do they see? 
<laughs> so let's show you studies now, I, now. Let me shrink this image. And what do the youngsters say now? Huh? Do you hear Marilyn Monroe in the back? And, 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 and the expensive seats here? You would say Marilyn Monroe, OK. So let's make this picture even smaller. <laughs> so now I guess everyone will see Marilyn Monroe. So what I'm going to show you here is a very simple example of what we call psychophysics. So that's not, you know, physicists run mad. That's, the, that's it's something that was started by von Helmholtz in the last in two centuries ago. And this was the scientific investigation of perception. And so he called that psychophysics. And what I'm going to, what I've shown you here is why the perception of this image changes on the distance or the size of the image that you're viewing. Because effectively, um, this image is composed in a very specific manner. Uh, so somebody took a picture of Einstein and encoded the low, the high fre sorry, the low frequency features as Einstein. And somebody took a, uh, an image of Marilyn Monroe and in, encoded here the high frequency features of the image. And then basically they added up these two images so that you get this composite image. Now, the fact that depending on the size of the image, you either see Marilyn Monroe or Albert Einstein means that something in your brain must decode the image in the way we compose that. So something in your brain must do something analogous to Fourier analysis. So this is the type of experiments I'm going to hit you with uh, in, in, in during my talk. Ways basically to trick or investigate the brain by seeing how it can be composed and decompose that information again. Importantly, if your brain would not use something akin to Fourier analysis to analyze an image, you would just see you know, a goggle of the image and two meshed pictures. So the very fact that you're able to decompose the brain is a test of the principle by which the brain may have analyzed this image. Now I want to show you a second thing, just to uh, clip in your feet. And this is, involves audio. Uh, can we have some audio? Oh, there it is. Okay. So now I'd like to ask the following thing in the audience. Can everyone who's sitting to the right of here please close their eyes? Okay, leave your eyes closed. And I hope we can reduce the noise. And just listen to what this man has to say. So those with their open eyes, look at this man and listen what he has to say. I'm going to play it again. Can we get rid of this background noise? Nothing to be done. Now, everyone open their eyes. Can I ask you what you heard on this side, please? Yeah. Dada. So on the left side, what did you hear? Dada. Dada. And on the right-hand side? Oh. Baba. Okay, so just to be sure, controlled experiment, let's reverse the roles. <laughs> yeah. And I'll play it again. So how is it that we all sharing the same space have heard two different things, and what we heard was based on the fact of what we saw? Lips. Right? His lips. Right, so there's something very interesting about us reading lips. Changing our perception of sound. So literally, you know, you're hearing with your eyes to a certain extent, because the eyes are very powerful, uh, visual information is very powerful in overriding what you're hearing, or in better words, to disambiguate slightly ambiguous information. Now, what's happening here is now more difficult to explain, and I don't have a simple uh, explanation for that, but the hunt for this explanation is something that we really want to achieve. And so, um, in, in, towards the end of the World War, Evan Schrodinger wrote this beautiful book, uh, what is life? And he has this beautiful sentence here, living matter, while not eluding the laws of physics as established up to date and up to this date, is likely to involve other laws of physics hitherto unknown, which however, once they've been revealed, will form just an integral part of science as the former. And so basically what I'm going to try to do is to find some basic laws that allows us to make prediction and explain nature as we have been uh, accustomed from physics and try to apply that to how the brain works. So why would such an approach be good? 
Well, um, there's a standard textbook in neuroscience, and uh, that's called Principles of Neuroscience. And every medical student and every biology student, I'm sure every psychology student, has to read this book. And over the years passing, the number of pages in this book um, was, in, in the first edition, 750 pages. And then more and more editions came out. And so then the data increased, so the more pages increased, and of course we're very good scientists, so we can do a regression plot through that, and actually predict the 2014 edition, which is actually 2,000 pages. So that's a very good trend. Now the problem is, um, these are the principles of neural science, and if you look into that book, what you find is a large, very large collection of facts about the brain. But you find what, in, what physicists would call principles. And that's because, basically, that over the years, uh, more and more experimental <coughs> methods became available that allows us to understand and measure more and more about the brain. But what we really need these days is, I think, um, and that's where the physics approach comes in, we need to counteract uh, the experiments with some theory and distill some principles and bring down the number of pages in the textbook. Okay? So if you want a career measure of a neuroscientist, uh, such as myself, uh, you should see but how many pages he brought down Candela Dahl over the life of his career. Okay? So this is in, an important fact that in biology you have this cross increase in the amount of information, but you really want to distill some principles. Now the mind is a complex matter, and there are various ways of thinking about that. And one way that really shaped my thinking was reading this book by this young physicist, David Marr, uh, who did his PhD in Cambridge, uh, and then went off to MIT to come up uh, with a consistent theory about how machines should see the world, machine vision, and how humans should see the world, human vision. And he wrote this beautiful book, and then died uh, the year after from a cycling accident, um, but uh, probably because he didn't see the car that hit him. But um, the interesting thing about what he suggested was that you can think about what a brain has to do, or a computer has to do to solve problems, at three different levels. At the top level, there's something he called the solution strategy, or the question, how should I solve or approach a problem? And that's what I call the computational level. Then once you've chosen a strategy, you can think about what calculations and representations of this solution do you need, and we can call that, uh, if you're a computer scientist, the algorithmic level. And then at the bottom of this hierarchy, you have the implementation. So how do you take this representation and calculations, the algorithms that you have, and actually calculate or compute stuff? And actually, if you look at this type of scheme, it's only at the very bottom level that it actually matters whether you're dealing with hardware or with wetware. And so, by studying the brain at these two top levels, we can basically operate at the level of a certain amount of mathematical abstraction that you can port to a computer so you can build solutions and see if they work, and you can study them in the brain. So now one thing that always fascinated me, and it's actually a big problem, is for me the question about variability in the nervous system. So this is something I've always been intrigued by, and it comes from the very simple fact. Uh, we are all made up of molecules, and we all know that these molecules are, uh, are subject to some form of thermodynamic fluctuations, uh, and simply because of their very small size, you can see a lot of stochastic effects. So this molecule here, it's called a voltage-gated ion channel, and it sits in the surface of the membrane, and it's basically acts like a transistor. So it opens and closes to a stimulus and then lets current flow through. Now if you look at the response, so this is the stimulus plotted here in millivolts, so that's, it senses the change in the potential across the membrane, is the amount of current it lets flow through. And so these are repeated identical trials measuring you know, the, the few million ions that flow through this ion channel. And you can see that on each trial uh, there's a large variability about how this protein responds. You couldn't have a working computer these days with a transistor that operates with this amount of noise. So that's the molecular level. How is this measured? Uh, that's with a measure a technique called patch clamp, for which Sackman and Mier, one of them a physicist, got a Nobel Prize in 1981. So they really suck an electrode onto that. But Variability is intrinsic of the protein. It's an intrinsic of the protein, yes. Yeah. Okay, so now we can take it to the next level. We can start looking at, so this is a molecule inside a brain cell. Now we can look at groups of brain cells, and we can look about how much information flows from one cell to the next. And so one cell is talking to the other cell, and it generates uh, a pattern of impulses. And you can see here these pattern of impulses. And this is the response recorded from the cell that receives that information. And upon repeated identical presentation of this 
physically triggered stimulus directly through current stimulation of a neuron, you see that the other neuron responds to it with considerable variability. And only if you average everything nicely, you get a fair representation of what happens here. So this is happens at the level of interconnections of neurons. And then we get to the third level, and that's actually the level at which we operate, the level of movement. So if I simply ask you to move your finger from here to here in a given amount of time, um, and I can simply track this uh, trajectory that you're making with your movements, um, I'm showing you here in dots the endpoints of where you will reach if the target is set here. Uh, then you will end up roughly somewhere in this region if I give you a very short time constraint because we will overshoot. The important thing is that your movements have variability, and you'll know that because just like trying to stabilize this laser pointer is a tricky thing. But you don't perceive that when you're acting, right? You perceive that when you act and make decisions and grab things, everything works perfectly reliable, unless it doesn't and you trip over. And that is because ultimately you have some form of variability in your motor output. So this is really the problem or the trouble with noise in the brain. We perceive an act normally without normally experiencing any form of noise. Yet all of us will tell you that one of the hallmarks of biological systems is that they're highly variable. And so a lot of biologists concluded that noise is very small and not relevant. Or, but it's, it may be large, but we don't have to care because there's this wonderful thing called evolution that means that we have adjusted for noise and we may have noise suppression mechanisms. Now, any experimental physicist will tell you, noise is a bitch. It's very hard to get out of your apparatus if you want to remove that. So really, the challenge here is how, if you now take these two assumptions that biologists make, is how does it then mean that you have to change the design of your apparatus? So it means noise must have affected structure in the brain in some way, because you have to adjust for that. And on the other side, at some other level, there must be some form of noise suppression mechanisms in the brain that influence the way the brain operates. Okay? And so I'm going to give you some examples of that. And just to be entirely clear about what I'm talking, um, you know, there's this concept of uncertainty in physics, and that's the actual concept I'm going to talk about. And uncertainty really comes out of two types of, uh, of, of uncertainties. One is noise, and true noise, stochastic processes that can come from you know, macroscopic to thermodynamic processes or for quantum processes that underlie these things. So this is truly unpredictable uh, mechanisms in nature such as the fluctuations of the properties of an ion channel. And then there's a second problem, namely that the world's ambiguous. So the very fact that you're observing a three-dimensional world with a two-dimensional retina, so a two-dimensional sensory service, means that I can trick you uh, with this necker cube, and you can perceive this edge of the cube to stick outward or inward. And so these two sources of uncertainty is what I'm concerned about when I'm going to use um, the words of uncertainty. So let's quickly look about what it actually the system that we're talking about actually looks like. So what you can do, for example, um, you can take a, a monitor and display a stimulus on this monitor, this circle, and you can move the circle across, and then this, this circle, white circle, will draw an image on the retina and move across the retina, and some neurons <coughs> in the brain will then you know, be connected to these different parts of the retina and receive inputs. So effectively, you can imagine that the stimulus runs over the surface of this neuron, and then you will get some form of simple impulses or signals from the neuron. And so one thing that you can do, and these are Nobel Prize winning recordings that I'm going to show you. Uh, this is 1976, I believe. Whoa, that's not what I want to show you. That's what I want to show you. So this is a monkey where a, a neuron in, in the back of his head that responds to vision. Um, is shown, and you can see how they move the stimulus and this pop, pop, pop noise in the background. That's the actual firing of this neuron. I hope I can get this video to work. So you can see that it's sensitive. Aha! Uh -huh. Clearly the presentation is sensitive to me using the laser. So, so you can hear that that the neuron is sensitive to specific stimuli in specific regions. They can vary parameters like the size of the stimulus. It's not sensitive if it's not in that specific part of the region. Somewhat sensitive if you turn off light in the surrounding or if you turn off, 
turn on light in the middle. And so in this way, you can start characterizing these neurons that produce some form of perception of the brain. So this is the stuff that the brain knows about. The brain knows nothing else than these pop, pop, pocks. Your brain has never seen a car, has never tasted the molecules of a coffee, has never touched an object. Everything that the brain sees is these pop, pop, pops. It has to make an image of the world, it has to be able to make decisions, learn from that, infer things, and then act upon that. And just to show you a very simple example about how, how easily you can be tricked by this, um, uh, this is, let's try to infer the structure of motion of this square. So let's look at it the way this neuron looked at it, so from a very small region. And I can now move this object to the left and to the right. So who of you can suggest the main direction of motion of this object by waving their hands around? Okay, so I see a lot of waving like that. But actually, that's not the case, because the object moves in a circle. So this is what we call uh, the aperture problem. Uh, it's not a double slit experiment, it's a single slit experiment, but it's a very big, big problem in biology. So what we can take from here is that clearly single neurons are not enough to explain our perception of the world. It must be about the integration of this information. So having you know, basically shown you, you know, how in some ways primitive the hardware of the brain is, let's do some comparisons to amazing hardware. So that's your amazing laptop CPU, uh, and, and that's your cortex. And so this is something I was very interested in uh, a bunch of years ago um, during my PhD, is what are the physical limits to how you can operate your brain? So we can now simply draw a comparison between your cerebral cortex. So that's this sheet of neurons. It's roughly two millimeters high. It's all wrapped up and bunched up in, in, your, in the surface of your arm and your head. It's roughly two square meters in area, if you all pull it out. And you get in your cortex roughly 2.5 billion neurons. And each of these neurons makes some 10,000 synaptic connections with other neurons. And so if you're really unfair to neurons, you can say that one synapse is equivalent to one transistor. <coughs> and a transistor is yes, no. A synapse is a lot more than yes, no. It can do intermediate values, but let's say it's yes, no. And we take uh, this, this laptop SEER CPU, which is 299 million transistors. And then you can start making comparison of the weight of the brain versus the weight of the CPU, the volume of the brain versus the volume of the CPU. And then we get into more interesting regions about the energetic demand of your brain, 16 watts to 34 watts. The signal range, uh, so in your brain you're at roughly 100 millivolts, and here you have a signal range of 1,000 millivolts in your CPU, and the signal bandwidth, which is ridiculously low. 1 to 20 impulses per second is what the average neuron does in your brain, uh, versus the 2.3 gigahertz of that machine here. And interestingly, the structures are, at the lower end, roughly the same size. So what does this imply if you simply do ratios? It implies that your brain has roughly 800-fold higher integration of computing elements, i.e. one transistor equal one synapse, than a CPU. It also means that roughly per computing element, your brain is 1,500 times lighter than your laptop CPU. But really the mind-blowing number here, that your brain is 200,000 times as sustainable. Okay? So, to, to visualize what this means, if I start a computation on this laptop, switch off Wi-Fi, switch off the display, and just let it chunk along, it means that this laptop, with this charge, can compute for roughly 520 years. That's your great 13 times grandfather could still then go back to this laptop with the charge that I put on this morning and still see that calculation running. That's how energy efficient your brain is. And that's really striking if you consider that your brain is really made out of salty water, that's the content of cells that acts as a conducting element, fat as an insulator, and proteins, yeah, proteins, yeah, egg, egg whites, for, for, for transistors. So it's, it's, it, in some ways, it's like the worst possible electronic device you can come up with. Okay, so to give you a feeling for how the brain actually looks like, 
You can look here at the structure of the brain, and so this is a fantastic technique that was developed, um, where basically through genetic manipulation they can make every neuron look in a different color, so it's stained differently uh, when you apply fluorescent light on it. And what you see here is the cell bodies of the neurons, so that's you know, the beating heart of the neuron, and then you see all this stuff, this felt work around here. Now, this felt work is nothing else but the connections of these neurons. And it's so densely packed that you get three kilometers of wires, connections, per cubic millimeter of your cortex. You get roughly four centimeters of wire per neuron. And the, the neuron itself is just 20 micrometer in diameter. And so you have 2.5 billion things of that. The whole thing programs itself, and even better, it assembles itself. You don't need a factory to make it. It just grows. So, based on all these things, we came up with this question, what are the physical limits to the systems? So one thing is that design channels that let stuff flow through, the, the egg white, right, is our noisy conductors. And the brain is clearly very densely packed. So how densely packed is it before you hit the physical limits of packing? So what we can then do is we can apply basic biophysical theory, so that's, you know, really not going beyond 19th century physics and start calculating what happens when you make things very slow. So you remember that you have these impulses that make pop, pop, pop. And so these impulses arise from the concerted actions of these little protein transistors. But because these transistors are very noisy, it means that um, if you shrink your cell, you have fewer and fewer of these transistors uh, per unit volume of cell. And that implies then that as the numbers become smaller, stochastic effects become more and more important. So now you can just calculate at what point will this whole system break down. And interestingly, and I will not go into the details of that, the way it breaks down is not that the system stops sending signal. What happens, it starts generating signals, random spurious signals. And what we then showed is that as you make you know, the neuron size smaller and smaller and the packing density of the brain increases, you get basically phase transition uh, for different types of <coughs> brains, roughly always occurring at roughly 0.1 micrometer diameter. And it's fairly robust to changing the basic physical parameters of the system, as long as you make sure that you know, it's salty water for conductor, fat for insulation, and these proteins uh, for... Um, for transistors. So you can take that next to the next ledge and then ask, okay, so clearly you should make something smaller than 0.1 micrometer because otherwise you have this phase transition and this thing just goes ballistic. But you can then ask, okay, how small can I physically build a very thin axon or a very thin cable? And you just can measure from you know, crystallographic data what you need to put inside a neuron so that it works and it can conduct information. So you know, we need something called a microtubule that gives a structural form. You need to transport the neurotransmitters that allow the neuron to talk to other neurons. You need to fit an ion channel and all that. And all these things we know have been measured. So if you really pack all the necessary ingredients, you get a structure that's 50 nanometer by 70 nanometer. But the calculated noise limit that we get is 0.1 micrometer, 100 nanometer. So what we then did is said, well, maybe actually noise sets a limit. And then we asked a question um, that no one in biology has asked before, bizarrely. Namely, what's the smallest known diameter of a nerve fiber? And um, uh, so when we submitted this to Nature, uh, one reviewer came and said, it's an entirely philosophical question. Why would you ever ask that? That was a two-line review uh, and rejection. Uh, but other persons are fortunately like that. And so what we then did is, you know, uh, that's me heroically plowing through 200 papers and, and you know, we're just finding the, you know, the, the Olympics of the smallest nerve fibers. And what you find is, so I plot here the diameter on a logarithmic scale, so that's 10 nanometers, 100 nanometers, 1,000 nanometers or 1 micrometer. And this is, you know, optic nerve in the cat, uh, some, some, some peripheral nerve in the rabbit, uh, something in, in, in human fetus or something that should be very small because it's developing. You can go across that and the ranges of diameters always hit 0.1 micrometer, with the single exception that I found, uh, and that's something in, in mouse embryo, you get something that's 0.08 nanometer, sorry, micrometer or 80 nanometers, but that's a non-functional functional axon. So that's a fiber that's developing, but it's not used yet, it's not connected up. 
And so then we went out and, and we actually gave out a prize. I, I pay a thousand pounds if you find me a thinner axon, and to date I had had no email on that. So then there was a, then even better, I found then a, a heroic PhD student by a gentleman. Uh, so this is a PhD student who, who looked at uh, 800,000 nerve fibers in the brain of octopus. Okay? And, and so and this was before computers, so he did it by hand. And he, he left after his PhD and became a headmaster in a very, <laughs> very good school, uh, outstanding very <laughs> officer. Anyway, he said in his PhD thesis, and this is the probability distribution, the histogram of the diameters for what he found, so the counts here are in the 10,000s, and this is 0.1 micrometer diameter. So it really looks like this distribution is pushed up against the limit. So what we then concluded out of this, and out of some other studies that I don't want to bore you with, that there are really physical limits set to the si size and diameter of the brain, to how much you can miniaturize the brain, and actually we are operating at the physical limit of what we can do. So that's good news for us, we've been really optimized by evolution in that respect. Um, it also means, okay, Maybe computers can actually surpass us in terms of the wiring density, but you still have to manufacture them. Right? And that's the most expensive process in the electronics industry, where you're paying several tens of billions now uh, dollars to just generate the next generation of computer chip factory. So this is, was an interesting factor. But now I've spoken a lot about individual neurons, but what we're really interested in is now how we do all this stuff, right? How do we enjoy this gentleman or not? So think about that. I've just spoken about this pock, pock, pock. So this is, uh, this is me working on uh, crickets, by the way. Uh, freely moving crickets when they are just, and, and I managed to actually record from several brain cells of this cricket in real time. And you can see here these pocks of this uh, cricket oh, all that sit here. Some are bigger, some are smaller. But this was the cricket acting out something in the world. In this were individual pox pox that moved the, 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 the legs and arms of the cricket. So this is, at some level, what the brain is doing. Right? It has to generate these pox and has to generate the right pox to control the right muscle. Yet when I stand here, uh, I explain you things at this level. Go to the coffee machine, grab the cup, press the button. That's a, fun, that's a huge gap between operating here and you know, having to generate this stuff. So just as an example for that, this is a beautiful thing that's stamp collecting again. So these are stamps from an alien planet. And um, an, an alien taught me that this stamp here uh, is uh, the symbol for a tufa. Now, who can see other tufas in this image? Can you point to the row or tell me the row column of other tufas in this image? Do you see other tufa? Is this a tufa? No? Is this a tufa? This is a tufa. I tell you, this is a tufa. <laughs> is this a tufa? No. Is this a tufa? Yeah, some, okay. Is this a tufa? Nah. But maybe this? Huh? Okay. So I've shown you a single data point. I've shown you one image and told you the label for that. And already you have a certain set of beliefs about what are tufas and not. Now I can actually tell you this is also a tufa. So how does now knowing these two objects being a tufa influence you about telling you whether is this a tufa? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And you're sure about that, right? And, and this guy? No. So I told you two things about the alien world, and you have a whole set of beliefs and hierarchies what may be more or less a tufa. Right? And I can continue with this example and so forth. In the end, it may turn out that tufa means simply something in front of a black background. Right. But, but this is an ability of your brain when I'm talking about cognition where you can do over very abstract things, very powerful inferences, which may or may not be true. But actually this is something that computers are utterly unable to do. You show them two data points and they have a whole set of rules of things. Okay, so there's some more two of us. So now we're going back to this idea about reverse engineering the brain. So what I spoke about here is stuff that's happening here. Right? There's a variability at this low level, noise. Right? And so this is what I, the, uh, the thing that I mentioned at the beginning, the two issues uh, for biologists to deal with noise in the nervous system. The one level is, oh, it's small. And it's actually not, because it sets physical limits. And the second was, if there's noise, it's not a problem because we've learned how to deal with that. So the question is, how do we, this, this nervous system that operates in a loop, so it will accumulate noise on every iteration of this loop, 
deal with noise or more generally uncertainty. And here comes, uh, uh, here comes really my, my, my pledge towards what could be a formulation of uh, how we can think about uh, theory of the brain uh, in, a, in a very primitive way. Um, I'm going to introduce that. It's not my idea. Several people had this idea. I'm just going to show you evidence in how we have used that so far. Okay, so there's such a thing called Bayes' rule. Yeah. Uh, that's the Reverend Thomas Bayes. And Bayes' rule is best told now in the days of, in the context of Ebola. Okay, so imagine there's such a thing. So we're talking about probabilities now. So it's like, you may have Ebola, that's fact A, and you may have a positive blood test for Ebola. Right? So you can write down the probability that you have Ebola and that you have a positive blood test for Ebola. What you really want to then do is, so this is what you measure, this is when you are a pharmaceutical company. You know, if you have a positive blood test, given that you have a positive blood test, what's the probability uh, that you actually have the disease? And uh, so this joint probability factors in the conditional probability here times the probability that you have a positive blood test. You can also factor that differently as the probability that you have a positive blood test given that you have Ebola, that's what we call the clinical trial, times the probability that the population has Ebola in general. So what you can then do, and this is the magic of PowerPoint, woo. so this thing now loops there, and what we now get is what we really want. So we want to infer something we cannot observe directly, the probability that you have Ebola, given that you have a positive blood test from the data from the clinical trial, you have a positive blood test given that you have Ebola, times the probability that you have Ebola, and divided by uh, the number of times the positive blood test comes positively. So what we're really doing here is we're taking information about the world, have some prior assumption about how the world works, and infer things that we cannot observe directly. Right? And just so to make you aware, if you have, for example, a probability of having Ebola of 1% in the population, just flat probability, but we have positivity to a blood test, and, and you have in your clinical trial established that that 70% of the people who have Ebola have a positive blood test. Now, given that fact that you have a positive blood test, what's your probability of having Ebola? Would you? 7%, very well calculated. Ridiculously low. Right, so that's something we have to be very aware of. If the prior probability, so your prior knowledge about the world, has very low chance of occurrences, even a very strong evidence, we can still result in a very low posterior probability. That's what we call the posterior. And so there was this beautiful paper not a long time ago called Why Most Scientific Results Are Wrong. Right? And the, the argument was we're testing things with a you know, 95% confidence interval, you know, 5% chance of error, so that's really strong. But if scientific discoveries are really seldom, right? so most tests will not, most ideas will not read uh, the problem, you will get here a very low probability of them actually being true. Now, that's a problem for science, and we can talk about that, but it's also a problem of, well, for your brain if we want to make some form of inference. Now, the question is, what does your brain know about probability theory? So let's start with something very simple. Look at this flat surface here. I assure you it's flat. I've shown you here now an ambiguous image that shows you three-dimensional structure as suggested by the structure of the image. Now, let me ask you, who of you thinks that this dimple here sticks into the wall. Who of you thinks that this sticks out of the wall? And you're absolutely sure about that. Yeah? Okay, keep watching. It's the same image, it's the same sensory information, but who now thinks that this dimple is sticking out? Those of you who have lifted their hand. None of them, right? So what has changed about this image? The sensory information is the same, but something else has changed. So you have a prior assumption that the light shines from the top. In fact, it's so powerful that, um, let's see if I can get this to work. That if I would continue my talk like this, 
you would feel very uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah? Because light has to come from the top. It's a very powerful assumption. <laughs> So what I've just shown you is how you use prior information about the world to disintegrate ambiguous sensory information. So remember what I told you at the start about uncertainty comes from noise and ambiguity. Right? That was the one thing. The second thing I told you is something about Bayes' theorem to make inferences about the world from prior knowledge and data observations that you can make. So this simple example, and also the example that I showed you of the vision and hearing to the gentleman, uh, listening to the gentleman talking and seeing him talking, is to illustrate the fact that maybe what your brain does, it knows something about prior probabilities in the world, and maybe the, the fact, what we call perception, i.e. what you experience, is actually not a it's not the physical reality, that's what I would call sensation, but the perception arises from an inference process about the world, and so you can basically then say that perceptual illusions arise from some form of rational system which is designed to make judgments in the face of uncertainty, just to help you survive. And so I want to take a step back here and go a bit into, philo into uh, yeah, philosophy of science. So there was this gentleman, Boo, who, who's, who talked about inference in the context of making true and false assumptions about the world. The problem is that his Boolean system does not allow you to make plausible reasoning. So consider this. Your friend is late. You're waiting for her. There may be three factors why this may have happened. A, she was abducted by aliens. B, she was abducted by terrestrial kidnappers. Or three, she was delayed by traffic. Yeah? How do we conclude that hypothesis three is the most plausible answer? If you would use Boolean logic, so yes, no, and, or, not logic, you could not answer the question. So there has to be something other way to make inferences about the world. And so uh, one of my favorite physicists uh, said then that probability theory is in fact only common sense reduced to calculus. And Laplace really was one of the fathers of thinking about inferences and probability, although his theoretical mechanics was everything but stochasticity and probability. It was entirely a deterministic worldview. So who really took this further was another physicist, E.T. James, and this is a fantastic book that he wrote. It's called Probability Theory, The Logic of Science. And I would really recommend that to everybody who does any form of science. So what he said was basically, for plausible reasoning, it is necessary to extend the discrete true and false values of truth to continuous plausibilities. And he introduced three mathematical criteria which must apply to all plausibilities. So the degree of plausibility must be represented by real numbers. The numbers must be based on the rules of common sense, which are, so they have to be consistent and non-contradicting. So if you can reach the same result through different ways, the result should always be the same for the plausibility. You have to be honest, right? you have to always take into account all data and it shouldn't affect the result. And it should be reproducible. So equal levels of plausibility, so equal levels of this number must induce equal levels of plausibility. If you make these assumptions, he proved that there's only one calculus that is self-consistent, and that's the calculus of probability theory that would allow you to use these plausibilities and these basic rules to make any inference about the world. Okay. So this implies then that if you do not follow the rules of probability theory and you have to make inferences about the world, you can be systematically exploited. And the first people who discovered that were Dutch businessmen in the 17th century because they realized that if you do not hedge your bets based on probability theory, and they had barely discovered it at that point, there's always a way to systematically exploit you. Yeah? So we call that the Dutch book. And so the biological argument here is that maybe the brain or our brains and those of many animals had to evolve so to implement these rules of basic reasoning, probabilistic reasoning, so as not to be systematically exploitable by other predators. Right? So that's my high-level um, logic of that. And this is actually a very powerful way of doing inference, and I'm just going to show you how. So I can ask you, for example, um, imagine this scenery here. 
So Sherlock Holmes is on holiday, and he receives a call from his neighbor that the alarm of his house went off. And he thinks that somebody broke into his house. That's likely. But afterwards, he hears an announcement on the radio that a small earthquake just happened. Now, what does this mean? Well, he knows that if there's an earthquake, the alarm is going off. And now comes the, 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 what, the mind-blowing thing. Because he knows the earthquake may have triggered the alarm, he now thinks the fact that the burglary caused the alarm is much less likely. And we call that explaining away things. So just to draw it up, so this is what Sherlock Holmes observes, a phone call, and he had recent information about an alarm. And this alarm may be caused by burglary or earthquake. Okay? But then he hears a second observation, a newscast that says there was an earthquake. And now, based on these two observations, you can conclude that this probability is much higher, and the, the link of these probabilities is the alarm, and therefore the probability of the burglary must have gone down. So this is a very powerful, simple logic, and I'm not going through the math at you, uh, what, how you can exploit that, but you can build very powerful inference engines of solving that. And actually, the most powerful in general way is a, it's a method called Markov Chain Monte Carlo, uh, actually developed for the um, uh, Manhattan Project to be able to calculate uh, fundamental parameters of the nuclear bombs. But the important thing is that this type of calculus allows you to do very powerful things. And I'm going to show you that in a minute. So from now on, it's, it's, it's end of philosophy, it's time of videos. So I should now ask you the following questions. Why do you think we have brains? We've talked a lot about brains. Why do we have them? Any ideas? Right? You're all students. You all need to train your brains. Why are you doing that? Why do you have brains in the first place? <laughs> okay, so to predict future actions. <laughs> so if you look at this picture here, and this is not my slide, this is a slide from, from one of my teachers that was very influential. And it's the question is, why do we have brains? If you look at all these organisms that live on our planet, these guys over here have brains, and these guys over here do not have brains. Okay? And these guys over here move, these guys over here do not move. So maybe, 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 uh, and if you belong to a club of people that call themselves the motor chauvinists, you, could, you can deduce that the only reason why you may have evolved brains is because you have to control movement. And in fact, if you go to very simple organisms, bacteria, uh, you will find that they first developed motors and then they developed sensors. Because there's no point to have perception if you, the perception cannot change action. So take this view, and, and, and this is if you believe, and I'm going to show you now what this actually means for real life. So if motor control is really easy, we should be able to master that. So this is Carnegie Mellon, PhD student. I don't name his name. He spent five years developing a robot that can stack cups. Uh, let's see what his our product was. So he programmed the solution, and the robot takes that and does that. Fantastic. On another trial, however, one of the cups was not perfectly aligned. You can see that here. So what happens? Whoops. And it failed. Okay. But, you know, five years of PhD get you to stack the cups if they're perfectly aligned. <laughs> so there's American PhDs. Maybe, you know, it became worse after the third year. But, um, <laughs> This, this young gentleman here, is the world champion in cup stacking, and this is his world championship attempt. Okay, now he hears that one of the cups was misaligned, so now he redoes the trial. And yay, he succeeds again. Yeah? So this is what it means, why it's very hard for engineers to control movements, although for you it's very trivial and you don't think about movements, and why for humans it's actually, it's, there's no effort involved because you have a huge set of machinery in your brain that deals with all this stuff. And I hope I can skip that. Just another way to illustrate that, actually how hard for even humans is to learn to control stuff, is high jump. So when the first Olympics happened in 1904, I believe, the way people jumped the high jump was they were running up to an obstacle and then doing this. Okay? That was the high jump. And then in 1928, 
a woman, of all things, came up with the idea that you may jump by lifting one leg over the other to come over the obstacle. And she won in 1928 the gold medal to the embarrassment of the male teams because they couldn't reach as high as she did. And so then later on, Cornelius Johnson had an even wackier idea you know, to really twist over the bar as he was jumping, and he reached 2 meter 3, gold medal in 36. And then comes the current technique, the famous Fosbury flop, where the completely crazy idea of running towards the obstacle, turning around, and flipping backward came up. And of course, this is an optimal solution, but at any given moment, his center of gravity is below the bar. So he actually doesn't need to lift so high. And that's why, uh, with the now world record, it's a 2 meter 45. So even you know, finding an optimal strategy for something as competitive and as simple as high jump took here, I don't know if it took 2,000 years, but for sure it took uh, 60 years of competitive just to find a better strategy. So just learning to do something better is really not trivial. And so this is really what we're interested in, in how can you do control and learning of movements. And if you can do that, I really believe you understand how the brain works, because we're motor chauvinists, that everything else is a consequence of how you control and learn movements. Because it helps you to deal with movement disorders. Many neurodegenerative diseases affect your ability to learn and control things, and you can build fancy stuff like brain-machine applicate interfaces. So you can apply that to do prosthetics, better robotics, help people with a stroke with rehab, or just build better computer interfaces. And let me show you an example. How much time do I have, Alex? I have no. Sorry, I have the timer here. Ten more minutes. Okay. So one way to think about that, and I'm now going back to the Bayesian theorem that I told you before, is that something very simple. So this is a scene we've all observed. Um, there's a striker and there's a goalie, and it's a penalty shootout. And the striker can basically now observe, sorry, the goalie can observe the striker. And as the striker runs up, um, basically, he will, the, the goalie will have information about where the ball will go. And in principle, the longer he observes the ball flying, the better he will know where the ball is going to end up. The problem is, it may take him some time to get there. So at some point, he has to say, stop, I don't look at it anymore, how much longer I want to look at stuff, and I just start moving. So what we call this is what we call limited time task, where you have to somehow trade off things. So in this case, the longer the goal you observe something, the lower his, his uncertainty or his variability about where the ball may end up. And of course, the more time he has to prepare his movement, the more accurate and precise his movement can be. So basically, if you take the amount of time, if you limit the time of total time of the task, every second that you spend more sensing, uh, you have a second less of moving. So if I plot here the amount of sensing time or the total time of, of the task, your sensory uncertainty goes down, but your motor uncertainty goes up because you've left time to move. So basically, the moment you start to decide to you know, go for the ball, you interrupt the reduction in uncertainty about where you end up, uh, sorry, where you think the ball is going, and you're setting with that effectively the uncertainty about where you're going to end up. So the question is, does the brain know about the an optimum point at which you stop, should stop integrating information? And this is just to show you another of these psychophysics experiments. Um, and so what we can do is, for example, simply measure uh, the variability that you have of estimating where something ends up. So this is how an experiment in the lab looks like. You can put a dot here, and then the dot falls to the ground. And then after a fixed time t, the ball becomes invisible, and now you're instructed or asked to tell me where did the ball land, and you tell me, I think it landed here. And you can do that over many times. And then you basically get an estimate about where you thought the ball was, where the ball actually was, and you get some form of curve that is a function of how big your error was or your uncertainty about where the ball lands, and you know how much time you observed something. And so this is the curve that I showed you earlier with the goalie. And similarly, we can do another experiment where I simply tell you the ball is here. Try to reach it as quickly as possible. And I show you how much time you have left to reach the ball. So um, I, you know exactly where the strike is going to shoot, but this is the amount of time of flight of the ball. And you can then try to go there. So I first show you how much time you have. And then within the time you have to reach the ball, and uh, you will end up somewhere, and you will make an error. So now you get a function of the error of your movement as a function of time. You have no uncertainty about where the ball is, you know where it is. And now we can do a third experiment. And this is really the striker goal experiment. You can observe now this ball, and the moment you start moving to catch it, 
the ball goes invisible. And this is what you can do with your virtual reality systems. I throw the ball, and the moment you start to move to catch it, the ball goes invisible to you. And now you can basically look at um, at this U-shaped structure that I showed you, which would be where is the minimum amount of variability. And now there's one thing I didn't tell you. Of course, the further you have to move, the faster you have to move. So it's not just a function of time, it's also a function of distance. So I'm plotting here the, the vari this, this U-shaped thing in, in a colorful picture where you know, red means high degree of variability, and we measure that as the standard deviation of where the ball lands versus where your hand and lands over repeated trials. <coughs> and the lower your uncertainty, so and this curve has a minimum that sits here somewhere in the middle, and it's a function of the time you start to move and a function of how far you have to move. And so from these two experiments that we ran, just measuring your sensory uncertainty and measuring your motor uncertainty, you can calculate the function uh, of this shape of this valley here. And the white dots that I show you were the subjects in the third experiment where they had to do this combined task actually moved. And you see they sit very close to the minimum of this U-shaped valley. But we can do something else. Because what we're actually adding up is the uncertainty or the variability of the sensory error, and you know that variances add for independently distributed random variables, then the sensory uncertainty plus the motor uncertainty must, in theory, give you the total uncertainty. Okay? So if that, all that is true, yeah, the two random variables are independent, you can add them up. And now I give you a glove to catch the ball that has different sizes. It can be very narrow size or big size. Then basically it means that if the total variability of the task, the sum of these two variabilities, um, is to the distribution of where your hand is with respect to the ball when it lands. So for a wide glove, you have a high probability, and it's the area under the curve. And for a narrow glove, it's something very narrow. So what I can plot here is the width of the paddle. And what I can plot here is the probability of you catching the ball. And the black curve is what I predict from the independent measurements of your pure sensory and your pure motor variability. And the blue circles is what the subjects actually do in the third task. So I can predict your chance of success with this curve here under the assumption that you know about the uncertainty relationships for sensory motor in time and space, that you can optimally integrate them following probabilistic calculus, and I can even predict how good you are at a task without ever having run the task. So these are not curve fits. They're zero parameter predictions. There's no free parameter. So this just gives you an idea that you can really do hardcore, hardly designed physics. And that's the end of my physics. And now I'm just showing you stamp collecting. Okay, so this is something that's very dear to me. I call it science that is wired. Okay, so we've seen how we can get very far in trying to understand the mechanisms with which motor actions and decisions are made in the brain using the spatial calculus. But you also remember from the Ebola example that somehow prior probabilities are important. So what I was actually interested in understanding is how do you actually move in the real world? So all experiments that we do are experiments that we do in the lab in highly artificial settings. And I wanted to know something about the prior probabilities of movement in the real world. And so I transformed my lab into literally a little <coughs> studio flat. And we started simply collecting everything that you do, how we do that. So we put people in a suit that captures all the movements of the body. And we put on them gloves that measure all the movements of each single finger joint. And then we put on them some form of glasses uh, that measure where the eyes are looking at any given instant. So the data set looks like that. So this is the view from the glasses that the person is wearing. So that's the view that the subject has. This green circle is where he's currently focusing his attention, where he's looking. And here you see the subject holding, wearing this, what we call the cyber glove, that measures all the joint angles of the finger. And then you can just start recording stuff. And that should play, I hope, like that. So I'm pointing to his finger, he's flexing the finger. Oops, no, sorry, that didn't work. And as he's flexing his finger, you can see that you know, the, all the joint angle measurements correlate with this data. Right, so we're collecting this, it's just stamp collecting. You know, it's just ecology, we're just observing stuff. But basically what we're doing is we're capturing <coughs> a large, large amount of the visual input that the subject has, so what's coming in, and we're measuring the motor output. Now in theory, you can measure, if you collect really tons amount of data, you can effectively go from pixel to muscle movement. So if you just connect enough data. So we've not done that to that extent, we've just done that on 60 people. 
where we have them wearing suit gloves and eye tracking. There's roughly a terabyte of data per person per day. So you have somebody like that. So you have all these you know, different variables that we track. And then we have also some people who basically watch what they're doing and are annotating that so we know what they do. And this is just some of the examples that we found. If you open any textbook about movement of the hand, it will tell you that the two most important movements of the hand are the power grasp and the print grip, the very precise grip. So my grad student did that. She wore this thing, the side of that, for a whole day, several days in a row. We measured the movements that she did. This thing here, she didn't do a single time during the whole day. Yet, when you have a stroke, you're rehabilitated on that. When you get a prosthesis, you want to be able to do something like that. Right, so just basic stamp collecting shows you, hey, maybe there's a problem here about what we assume we know about our movements. Our priors are wrong. In fact, we don't have any priors because we don't have any data. If you chase out the literature, who says that these are the two most important hand movements, you end up in 17, no, 18th century Surrey. Some country doctor said that. Huh? And he said, these are the two most important movements. Of course, he didn't collect the data for that. But you know, up to now, up to this day, you know, hand surgeons, rehabilitation people, will uh, go back to this uh, 17th century, 18th century paper and give you this data point. So what this means is that if you have this data properly, uh, we, what we really want to be able to do is, you know, if you lose, for example, your hand, you want to be able to be as, as flexible as Jamie Oliver. This is a standard hand as it's prescribed now. It can do this. And this is the most sophisticated robot hand, arguably, that's currently on the market, the shadow robot hand. It has all the degrees of freedom of this hand, but they don't know how to control it. So they don't know how to program it to do all these things. So just so you know what the two most important hand movements are, so we can then do some data analysis techniques. And instead of saying, I think this is an important movement, you can just leave, let the data speak for itself. And you can do that in various ways. And we have chosen one way. We call this eyeing motions. Uh, I have to guess where this comes from. And you basically, these are the two principal uh, shapes of motion. And you just need with these four, just four eyeing motions can recreate 82% of all the movements that you make during a day. And so we think that's really important because, so this is the standard robot commercial prosthetic hand that has, you know, does this. That's one number that you have to read from the brain. This is the robot hand that you need 22 numbers to control. But if you know that there are icon motions, um, you can basically control 82% of daily life with just four numbers. And that's great, because it simplifies controlling these prosthetics a lot easier. And so we even started to print our own 3D prosthetic hands that you can just download and print out, and we call that an under-censored uh, prosthetic, because we just need fewer numbers. So another thing we can do with this data set, eyes. So your eyes look into the world, stare at objects, and you can do this with eye tracking, so you can look at different things. And your eyes always jump from point to point. They cannot generate smooth movements unless you have a target that you can track. But if you don't have that, you cannot generate a smooth path, just so you know. And I know this are very interesting, because a large amount of diseases that affect your ability to move affect basically very little, or just to a limited extent, your, your eye movement ability. So in Parkinson's, <coughs> eye movement are a little affected. Multiple sclerosis, they're literally little, little affected. Muscular dystrophy that kills all your muscles but eye muscles. If you suffer a spinal cord injury, your eye movements are really not affected because the eyes plug straight into your brain. Many forms of stroke affect less eye movements, and they, so the probability that a stroke will affect your eye movements is lower than it will affect any of your limb movements. Amputees don't have affections of eye movements. And if you're simply getting very old and get arthritis, so you cannot move your body well anymore, you still have much more control over your eye movements. So this becomes interesting because currently the, the old fashion is, and it's really impressive stuff they're doing, is brain-machine interfaces. And this video doesn't play, I apologize for that. But basically what you see here is a monkey that has some chips implanted into the brain, so you cut open the brain, you plug in some electronics, uh, you then make this monkey train for six months so you know what this monkey is thinking, and the, actually it's the monkey that learns what the robot is thinking and you control the robotic arm, and it's, it's, it's great stuff. Fantastic work, but you spent a lot of time training someone <coughs> to control a prosthetic robotic arm. So this is what we really call the challenges to brain machine interfaces. You need to do expensive operations, you know, old master style, put stuff in there. You need to do complex calibration. 
you get very little information out of that noisy structure that you're coding from. You have to therefore average for a long time, so the system's very slow. You need weeks or months of rehab and training to use them, and therefore many, many patients do not use them. In fact, there's a classic story of, of the person that said, this one of these prosthetic hands I showed you earlier, this Autobox C hand, and they will take them off before they take off their shoes. And I think this is a story that I heard also from other people independently. Yeah? They come home, they take first off the prosthetic before they take off their shoes. So this is how unnatural all this feels. And so therefore, I think that you know, we need to think about how we can embody this stuff. Now I spoke about our movements. So what we simply did is, because we wanted to measure our movements, is we simply tried to measure our movements very cheaply. That's currently very expensive. You pay around 20,000 pounds for a good eye tracker that gives you three-dimensional information about where you're looking. Uh, so I got a bunch of students together and we developed something that costs 43 pounds at equal precision. And so this is some old stuff we did. So uh, we put this on the head of a person. Sorry, this should play like that. And we, we uh, sorry, I shouldn't press the laser pointer. Mm -hmm. So we basically moved his eye, we tracked his eye movements. And then we translated this in this very simple case in some, simply a, into a mice mouse cursor that simply follows the mouse and in this case allows you to play Pong, an arcade game. Yeah. This is not radically new, this was there before, but instead of 20,000 pounds we can do it for 43 pounds. Okay. So now the question is, um, you all heard of King Midas, the famous king, that whatever he touched turned to gold. So if your mouse goes somewhere, you don't want it to execute something, so you need some way of articulating that. So you can then do something that we call wink to click. So if you do a wink, then something is like a mouse click. Right? Because you don't wink naturally. You blink naturally, but you don't wink naturally. And so we use this very simple way of interfacing and this enables <coughs> paralyzed patients to, to you know, surf the web or type on an on-screen keyboard. And then we took that further, and you can then, this is just basically running off this Bayesian framework I showed you at the beginning in terms of calculations, and some knowledge about the priors of eye movements and, <coughs> and hand and body movements to basically allow you to actuate a robotic arm here. And this is, in this case, a BBC presenter who came in you know, 20 minutes before that, super important, and wanted to do this thing, and he could straight away do that. There was no training involved, no rehab, he just used it. And um, I can tell you that when you use this device, it, it feels very powerful because you really, the thing follows your thoughts because the reaction time of this thing is so fast that it just takes a few, uh, few milliseconds to act things out. Okay. And so then the next thing was then this. Uh, whoa. So then we can, uh, we, we built a different eye tracker and we put it on a wheelchair. And so we correlated now, we put people in the wheelchair, we made them drive an electric wheelchair with a joystick and recorded their eye movements. So we had a mapping from action intention to how they were looking at the world. And we turned that again with this amazing Bayesian calculus into a decoder. And what we had was um, a wheelchair that you can drive around. And this existed before. Brain-machine interfaces allow you to drive around wheelchairs. But this wheelchair drives fully freely. You can just step into it and use it almost immediately. So again, no rehab, no training, you just use it. And, and the thing is also ridiculously cheap because it runs on any electrical wheelchair. Okay? So what I'm basically trying to show you is that if you understand something about this, how this perception action loop works, if you have really strong priors that inform your inference <coughs> that you're doing, you can really drop the cost on the stuff. And what I've shown you is that you can basically hack yourself some technology together and it works. And I'm not surprised that it works because, as I showed you at the beginning, I showed you that we have not ideal hardware to do a lot of calculations. Salty water, fat, and proteins for transistors. Yet the whole brain gives us a really powerful thing. You can do the TUFA thing with a single data point, which no computer can do at the moment. So maybe this means that actually, you know, you don't need amazing hardware. Even very low quality hardware allows you to do very powerful things if you have the right data and if you have the right algorithms. So this is something that we tried to show and this created a bit of a stir in the community. This is the cost of a device in a logarithmic scale, so 100,000, 10,000. And this is the number of bits per second. So the number of yes, no answers you can read out, right? So, you know, you think in terms of your megabit Ethernet connection in your college room, 
here we're talking about bits, 32 bits, 16 bits, 8 bits. And so this monkey interface here operates around 2 to 8 bits per second. So 8 yes, no answers per second. Uh, this brainwave thing has something like 2 to 3 bits per second. It really takes a long time to do things. If you simply use eye tracking, you can read out almost at 43 bits per second. So what I've been really talking about here, and I'm coming to the end now, is the power that you have if you can use you know, simple approaches, simple inferences informed by the right amount of information in what I would like to call a physicist's way of thinking to address fundamental questions that can help people but also to explain something about the brain. And really in this day and age, we really call this the billion dollar question because there are currently two um, efforts on the way. So the European Union has pledged 1.2 billion euros over the next six to 10 years to simulate all the neurons in the brain. Um, that's a highly controversial project, and I'm, 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 an, uh, not an I'm, I'm an opponent of this project. And then there's a much more sensible initiative in the, um, in the US uh, that was launched by Obama very recently, where they're pledging effectively $2 billion to record from every single neuron in the brain. And the argument here is, of course, that every dollar that you invest in the Human Genome Project, which was just measuring the genes in the brain, brought $140 of investment in return. So what we really, really want to end up on is this idea that the way you can think about nature is, uh, is that it's a beautiful system that acts all together, right? So this is this beautiful lady playing volleyball on the beach, as painted by Picasso. But uh, the way we often look at nature is more like this. You know, decomposed into its element and looked at this individual level. And so basically what I want to, to tell you is maybe we should use some you know, systems level thinking of thinking about systems and not about elements to put this back together. And so here, uh, I, I was trying to put in Occam at some point, and there is a link to Occam, but I couldn't find the link in the time I had, so I'm just going to say it straight away. So I think the dude for me is not Occam in this case, it's really <coughs> Thomas Bayes. Yeah. Uh, with his, the, or the logic that he came out of this, the idea of being able to make latent inferences about the world, uh, using the rules of probability and understanding something about the psychosticity in the world. Okay, and of course I should say that I didn't do this work alone, I'm just the guy who talks about that, this is the team at the moment, um, and basically they've done a lot of the hard work, and these are the people who paid for it so far. Thank you. Thank you, Aldo. And I think we have a few minutes to uh, ask some questions. Questions? Thanks very much, Rachel. I was wondering, um, going back to what you were saying earlier about the noise in the brain, um, is it possible this could have beneficial effects in the brain? As in, you know, so, so one, one question that comes to mind is um, it's difficult to explain how does the brain seem to produce new knowledge and could this have any kind of help with that sort of thing? So I think that's, that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> And I always have to laugh at this question because uh, usually you get some a chorus of physicists saying, oh, there's stochastic resonance, which is a, a very specific way in which noise can enhance uh, signal detection. Uh, and there's been a flurry of physicists going into neuroscience finding stochastic resonance everywhere. And so that's one benefit. And but what, of course, you're saying is something actually much deeper, namely that you need to be able to generate new stuff. You need to be able to do new things. You need to try new things. And the question is, what is the mechanism that allows you to try new things? And maybe it is really, and I, I believe that actually, it's, uh, it's structured stochasticity, so random exploration which basically the correlation structure you can manipulate based on some experience that you have, but you're actually doing some form of random exploration. Um, the problem is at the moment I still don't know how to, how to s measure that in, in, a, in a proper way, but I think it's a very good point. Um, what are your plans for this in the future? Like, where do you see this going? What can this do? Kind of, where do you see this happening in the next 10 years? So what's the time frame? 
Uh, you've got 10 years and then 50 years. <laughs> if you're 10 and then like 100. <laughs> So in 50 years, I, I may not be around anymore. Let's, let's try with the 10 years. So I think, so I've spoken a lot about, you know, now about low level control of stuff, you know, helping people to move and control things, and basically being able to understand low level things. You know, how do you learn to, you know, to, to, I mean, to open an egg, for example. It's a completely non-trivial task from a robotics perspective. But if you think about it, it's a fairly trivial task. Um, thinking about uh, how do you learn to cycle or ride a bicycle. If you write down a bicycle as a set of differential equations that you need to parameterize and then find a control policy of that, right? Um, you can imagine how complex that becomes. And that's still all just very low-level control. But what you're actually doing when you're learning stuff is you're not just learning the low-level stuff to do. You're also learning about how to put the high low level stuff together. So there's a mixture between you know, being able to do individual things and x-rate them and how to sequence them together. Think about preparing a cup of tea, for example. You, know, so you need to do a bunch of low-level actions, and you need to string them together. So what I, what I find the interesting question now is how we can take the bridge from this low-level stuff to the more high-level stuff, so to more cognitive stuff. So how is it, that's what was mentioned at the start, you can plan and think about things in very abstract terms. Go and grab a coffee, go do this. But at the same time, the brain at the low level is learning all these low-level commands. Yeah. Um, thanks again for the nice talk. Uh, my question was about you know how you showed the plot about motor variability and people sort of if you don't give them enough time they <coughs> they go to shoot over the target. How do you explain sort of people getting better at something like the practice makes perfect? I mean, oh. Not every one of us can be a goalkeeper. Okay, so, so if, if, if you would have had more time, I would have given all of you a sheet of paper and asked you to fold it in half and then go from the middle point of one paper to the other with a pen and go back and forth. And you can do that. And you can practice it how much you want. You will not be able to reduce the circle of point spread that you will have. There's you here looking at the physical noise limits of the accuracy of your movements. Okay, so in some ways, you cannot improve your thing, just like with this ball catching task. Your system has a certain amount of noise in the sensory part and in the perceptual and the motor part, and different players have different efficiencies at playing this game. So if you're Tiger Woods, you're really good at controlling this, but you cannot learn to do it better in terms of the noise level. But maybe your question was about something else. Your question was about how can you learn to improve your things? I've not shown you any results in learning. Um, so that's the question, like, how do you find new and better policies of controlling your movements? So there's something that you can do. Sometimes you can find an optimal solution that minimizes variability, for example, um, and allows you to you know, put the ball into the, into the hole in golf. But you still always have to operate with this uh, background level of uncertainty. <coughs> Um, so two questions about uh, Bayes' theorem. Mm -hmm. So the first point is, how are we Bayes' theorem fundamentally plenty algorithmic? So how successful are our attempts to uh, persuade a computer to think Bayes in a Bayesian fashion? And the second question mm -hmm. is, um, so we seem to think that the subconscious uh, works very effectively in a, in a Bayesian manner. It's very, um, it's used to the idea of, of, of handling some kind of a prior input and um, and then an extract the process of posterior probability out of it. Um, on the other hand, the conscious, the conscious mind seems very reluctant to deal with that. It seems to be dominated by the, you know, the, the almost the risk, you know, the, the, the more shocking idea, the more uh, unusual idea will dominate the conscious thought. So how has the subconscious evolved to treat, to handle ways in our um, Probability is so much better than the conscious. So, so, so my reply to that is that I'm a systems neuroscientist, so I don't know what consciousness is and I can't measure it. If you give me a way to measure it, I'm happy to talk about subconscious and conscious. Um, so I can't help you there. Uh, but I can help you maybe more about the first question that you had, if you can just can repeat that briefly for the audience. Uh, so, the, sorry. Uh, so, so the question is, you know, Bayes' theorem is fairly algorithmic. How successful are attempts to persuade a computer to essentially to learn from its so um, there's a branch in, so I really don't want to call it artificial intelligence, but this is where people, where people are trying to make machines learn, right? And we call it machine learning. Um, and machine learning, the most successful branch of that is probabilistic machine learning, where people are really putting these algorithms 
based on Bayes' theorem and you know, systematically calculating the true to find optimal solution, optimal solution strategies. So in, the, in this hierarchy I told you at the start, where you have the solution strategy, then the algorithm, and then the implementation, almost always you can write down a Bayesian formulation of the problem, and you will get in, in the terms of inferences and a very good solution, and then you can try to find algorithms. And in many ways, many branches of machine learning are really the most powerful if they use that approach, in contrary to other approaches that may be more heuristic. So this is an important thing, and that's an important thing to me as a physicist. So an engineer doesn't care so much about that, but a physicist does. The Bayesian approach is extremely principled. You understand it. There's, you, know, you can derive things out of that. While um, parts of engineering are very heuristically driven, so they're just interested in something that works, they don't understand why, and then weird things can happen, and they don't understand why. So, yeah, so I think in many ways that approach can be very powerful. Guys, I think we have to stop now, but what I propose is that you know, those of you who have burning questions, which I'm sure is an ever-increasing number, uh, actually maneuver themselves to sit next to the speaker at the dinner, if you're coming to the dinner, and uh, that conversation can continue on and on and on. But uh, in the meanwhile, before we go to dinner, let's thank Alan again.